Good afternoon. The first item of business today is a statement by Michael Russell on Brexit, preparations in the light of recent developments. And I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, after today, there are only 19 sitting days in this Parliament before the UK is due to leave the EU. Meeting the legislative pressures of a possible no-deal Brexit has been challenging, and I acknowledge the flexibility and diligence this Parliament, its committees and their conveners have demonstrated in carrying out that role. However, it is clear there is a substantial backlog of Brexit legislation at Westminster, and to date only 73 of the 115 UK st uh, statutory instruments to which we have consented have actually been laid in the UK Parliament. No one I have spoken to in recent weeks, with the exception of the Prime Minister, believes that Westminster can complete the work it has to finish on Brexit preparations in the time available. Accordingly, the Scottish Government believes it's essential that two things happen at the earliest possible date. Firstly, the Prime Minister must seek an extension to the Article 50 process, no matter what other task she has set herself. That is essential, even in legislative, let alone economic and political terms. And secondly, she or the House of Commons must take formal legal steps to rule out a no deal, which would reduce the pressure on businesses and individuals, as well as on the parliaments of these islands. Presiding officer, in December last year, this parliament voted decisively against the Prime Minister's EU withdrawal deal, and for very good reasons. The Prime Minister's deal would make Scotland poorer, place us at a serious competitive disadvantage, and combined with the UK government's hostile immigration policy, uh, actually make a fall in Scotland's working taxpaying population inevitable. In addition, the proposed deal provides no certainty. It will mean years of difficult negotiations with no guarantee that a trade deal can, in the end, be achieved. Last week, the Prime Minister seemed to agree with us incredibly voting against her own deal by backing the Brady Amendment seeking alternatives to the backstop, a backstop she negotiated, an alternative she and her colleagues, including the ever-flexible Secretary of State for Scotland, said just two weeks ago did not exist. They still don't exist. The Prime Minister's deal isn't the solution to this problem, it is the problem. It represents the inevitable outcome of ill-conceived red lines, and it is those red lines that need to change. Alternatives are possible. In fact, they're absolutely essential, and they are available. In 2016, the Scottish Government set out compromise plans that would keep both Scotland and the UK in the single market. Now, with the clock ticking down to exit day, the Scottish Government is working with others to try and obtain an extension to Article 50 to avoid a catastrophic no-deal outcome and allow time for a second referendum on EU membership. However, as a responsible government, we must also act to minimise and mitigate the impact of a possible no-deal outcome in Scotland. We will do everything we can in that regard, although I repeat the caveat I added when I last updated the Chamber about this matter. We cannot do everything. Extensive preparation has been underway for some time, but in the first weeks of this year, we have been steadily intensifying the work. Under the leadership of the Deputy First Minister, reporting to the First Minister, the Scottish Government's Resilience Committee continues to provide a clear, coordinating structure with COSLA, civil contingencies responders, and Police Scotland participating in these arrangements alongside senior civil servants and Cabinet Secretaries. It will meet again later today and next week during recess. Cabinet will also meet during recess to hear a further update as we are now preparing for the potential need to operate these arrangements on a permanent basis in the event of a no-deal outcome and to activate public communications. I've also attended two special UK government ministerial meetings in recent weeks which have considered no-deal planning. We continue to engage on these matters with the UK government at the highest levels. The Deputy First Minister will attend another UK cabinet subcommittee on EU exit on Monday. The Scottish Resilience Partnership is coordinating work across Scotland to ensure that local resilience partnerships are fully engaged in planning, mitigation and preparing arrangements to respond to any of the civil contingency issues arising out of EU exit. A national EU exit civil contingencies plan is being developed on a multi-agency basis and will be tested and exercised shortly. A no-deal Brexit presiding officer has the potential to generate a significant economic shock which could tip the Scottish economy into recession and potentially into a deep recession. It would also have a severe impact on the labour market, resulting in potential job losses, business relocations and closures, underemployment and a reduction in recruitment. The SME sector is likely to be the worst hit. 
Alongside the UK government, we're trying to rectify that. Uh, we would support measures to ensure there is increased liquidity in the banking system should it be required. As part of our support for business, the Prepare for Brexit campaign offers practical advice which can help to safeguard as much as possible in these circumstances a company's own growth and that of the Scottish economy. On transport, it remains our aim to try and secure the best flow of essential goods to, into Scotland. We're concerned at the possibility of severe delays to freight traffic through Dover and the Channel Tunnel. We're working with the Department of Transport to establish the extent to which its contingency <coughs> plans are addressing Scotland's needs for critical goods, and in particular how rurality can be factored into supply chains. Given my constituency experience, I am especially conscious of the position of the Scottish Islands, and I discussed some of those matters when in Orkney earlier this week. Transport Scotland is also working with transport providers and ports and airports in Scotland to assess their existing capacity and identify how they could help mitigate disruption and ensure that Scotland's exporters can continue to get their goods to market. Uncertainty about future tariff arrangements provides another key demonstration of the potentially damaging consequences of a no deal. Studies by the British Retail Consortium and others suggest that in the absence of a trade agreement between the UK and the EU, reversion to WTO tariffs for imports and exports could lead to significant price increases, particularly for food and drink. The Governor of the Bank of England has identified potential rises of between 5 and 10 percent. Our red meat industry and seafood sector will be severely impacted by punitive tariffs. The seafood sector will also be required to comply with a range of additional administrative burdens for which the, the support for which does not presently exist. We're also seeking urgent clarity and updated UK government technical advice and protected food names. The UK given, failed to, government failed to consult or even inform us of the updated notice yesterday. The, Scottish, the UK government states that current holders, for example, Scottish salmon, beef and lamb, may need to reapply to the EU for protection in Europe and in other countries where there is mutual recognition. It has long been clear also that leaving the EU under any circumstances will have a negative impact on the health and social care sector. If free movement is curtailed, this would have serious consequences for the recruitment and retention of health and social care workers. On medicines, the Scottish Government is working with all other UK administrations to make sure that patients get the medicines and other medical supplies they need as far as possible. Many of the practical issues connected to medicine supplies, such as entry and customs controls, are out with devolved competency. And we continue to raise specific concerns directly with the Department of Health and Social Care. And in addition, last week, the Scottish Government's Chief Pharmaceutical Officer wrote to pharmacists and other health professionals to provide information and advice. One particular point being emphasised is that it is important that patients take a careful view, discuss issues with their GP and pharmacists, and do not rush to increase their own supplies. A no-deal Brexit also raises concerns in areas such as the supply of medical, medical devices, clinical trials, access to future EU funding, and the rights of Scottish citizens to secure state-provided health care across the EU. NHS Scotland boards are taking forward their own planning to mitigate this with Scottish Government support. If there was a no-deal outcome, uh, it, it, we could be denied access to many of the security and law enforcement cooperation measures that Police Scotland and the Crown Office use daily to keep people safe. We would lose membership of Europol, the use of the European arrest warrant, and access to vital information sharing arrangements. That would represent a significant downgrading of our policing and security capability when cross-border crime and security threats are increasing. As the Chief Constable outlined to the Justice Subcommittee on Policing last week, Police Scotland is taking forward extensive preparations for loss of these measures, working closely with the government. It's also making arrangements to ensure that officers are available for and trained for civil contingencies, demands and for mutual aid requests. Police Scotland has today announced plans to put 360 officers on standby from mid-March to deal with any incidents that may arise across the country, such as disruption at ports. Across the Scottish Government, we're aligning our existing financial and staff resources towards those areas with specific no-deal impacts and ensuring we have the right people in the right places with the right skills to respond quickly and effectively. Across the public sector, resources are being diverted to essential preparations. A decision to remain in the EU would allow those resources to be returned to the support of frontline services and the delivery of Scotland's priorities. Our basic principle, however, is this. The Scottish Government believes that any costs related to EU exit by public bodies, be they in government, local government or the public sector, should not have a detrimental impact on Scotland's public finances. 
Finally, let me turn, presiding officer, to communications. The Scottish Government does not intend to replicate the UK approach of publishing a myriad of technical notices. Where those affect Scotland or Scottish issues, we're happy to see them distributed. We've done our best to influence them. We will, however, do all we can to ensure that the people of Scotland get a clear, consistent message about the work that is being done and what actions they need to take. We've therefore launched a public information website to provide important advice around issues such as transport, food, medicines and citizens' rights. It is now available at mygov.scot forward slash EU exit. This will be regularly reviewed and updated in order to ensure that the latest information is made available. We are coordinating our message with the UK government where possible and supplementing their message as we feel necessary. That is the right way forward in terms of resources and clarity. Presiding officer, we shouldn't accept the suggestion that no deal is somehow inevitable, nor should we allow anyone to normalize it. There are elected members of the Conservative Party whose aim seems to be not to remove no deal as an option, but actually to champion it. Instead of facing them down, the Prime Minister is indulging and pandering to their extreme views. Unless and until the UK government takes the necessary steps to rule no deal out, the Scottish Government must go on with and indeed intensify our work to prepare as best we can, though Scotland did not vote for this and should not be having to go through it. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a statement? I would encourage all those who haven't yet pressed and wish to ask a question to do so now. I call on Adam Tompkins to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement. Um, only in the through the looking glass world of nationalist doublespeak, however, could we have condemnation of a no deal Brexit coupled with condemnation of the only deal on the table that would avoid a no deal Brexit. Now, I agree with much of what the Minister has said about the dangers of a no deal Brexit. I do not support a no deal Brexit and I cannot foresee the circumstances in which I would do so. This Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee has said that it is strongly of the view that a no deal Brexit would be damaging to the Scottish economy and is clearly not in the national interest. That was an all party view in committee and I agree with it. The Prime Minister has opened all party talks on seeking a solution that avoids a no deal Brexit and that can command majority support in the House of Commons and the agreement of the European Union. Even that great statesman Jeremy Corbyn is now taking part in these talks, but not Nicola Sturgeon. Last week, there was a meeting to which the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales were invited, chaired by the Prime Minister. The Chancellor attended, as did the Home Secretary, the Foreign Secretary, the Brexit Secretary, the Secretary of State for International Trade, the Secretary of State for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The First Minister of Wales was there, but not the First Minister of Scotland, and nor is she attending next week, we've just been told. Doesn't this tell us all we need to know, presiding officer? Nicola Sturgeon is not interested in negotiating an orderly Brexit. She's not interested in governing at all. She's interested only in grievance and grandstanding. Does the minister not realize that Scotland has long since seen through it? Cabinet Secretary. Hey story of this is written, the inability of Adam Tompkins to respond to the serious circumstances and the reality of the situation will at least merit a footnote in the history. Let me address the points that he has made such, such as they are. Let me start, however, with the issue of uh, the Lewis Carroll looking glass world. I, I, I'm not an expert in Lewis Carroll, but I do think the spectre of a prime minister who in the end votes against her own deal, as she did last week, would be seen as being something in the looking glass. Because that is what has happened. The Prime Minister has walked away from the deal that she had agreed because she is afraid of the extreme Brexiteers. But let, me, let, me then, let me then move on to the issue of what is actually happening in talks. And I'm always aware that Adam Tompkins, while he regards himself as being in the loop, is actually not even in the outer circle. There are... <laughs> There are, well, the, the, I wouldn't use the word loopy, of course, being unparliamentary, but I think it's not a bad word. Um, the, the reality is that he has confused two things, and perhaps deliberately, or perhaps he simply doesn't know, so let me tell him. A, the, the Nicola, Nicola Sturgeon has sat down with the Prime Minister to talk about the issues surrounding Brexit and how they might move forward. I have been present twice in Downing Street in recent weeks with the First Minister when those discussions have taken place. Adam Tompkins, of course, has not been present, so that probably explains why he doesn't understand it. 
There is a different and parallel process going on, which is the preparations for no deal. Uh, that is a technical process established with this cabinet subcommittee to which the First Minister of Wales and the First Minister of Scotland were asked either to attend or to send their appropriate representatives. Now, in the structure of the Government of Wales, the First Minister is taking this on. In the structure of the Government of Scotland, then the people responsible for it are the Deputy First Minister and myself. Deputy First Minister chairing uh, the score committee, myself in terms of the, the work that I'm doing to implement some of those decisions. Therefore, I think we were and remain the appropriate people to attend this, just as the First Minister will continue to meet with the Prime Minister. Though I have to say my experience of those discussions with the Prime Minister has been the Prime Minister isn't trying to uh, learn anything from anybody. She's simply trying to persuade people that she is right. Uh, I'm afraid she isn't, and she won't succeed in persuading us. Neil Findlay to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Neil I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the early sight of his statement. I'm delighted Mr, Cor uh, Mr. Tompkins recognises Jeremy Corbyn as a statesman, not a charge that you could ever level against Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, Liam Fox or any of the rest of them who got us into this mess in the first place, Mr Tompkins. As Brexit uh, approaches, the anxiety of businesses and people in industry and workers grows. We've tried, we've all tried our best to speak sense to the Prime Minister, but she's engaged in a 40-year Tory civil war over Europe, uninterested in who gets caught up in the fallout. Just this week, we've seen Nissan state that they're no longer going to make their newest model of car in Sunderland. These are very serious concerns. Jobs will be lost, and it was all, of course, very avoidable. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary on Article 50. It's inconceivable that we can simply march off the cliff in a few weeks' time. That would be an outrageous act of self-harm. How can the UK government go on telling people everything's going to be all right when they clearly have no plan? How are the Tories going to deliver a deal that doesn't threaten living standards, jobs, and our strong relationship with our European neighbours? We've waited in vain for over two years for an answer. President officer, on a practical level, the government is right to plan for no deal and indeed has a duty to do so. And we've raised the issue of preparations in Parliament many times before. So I want to offer my party's full support to the Cabinet Secretary for the planning being done. A question, on, Mr. Finley, please. On business continuity and transport, medicines and all the rest of it. We will support the government's actions to prevent chaos. But on the issue of communications, I think this is the key issue in this. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how, other than referring to people to a website, how will businesses and the, the community know uh, what is happening in concise and unconfusing information in terms of the developments that may occur. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to the member for the support that he and his party are giving to this process. Uh, I think he's right to identify communication as a key issue, and particularly business communication. The, the, the take-up of information has been alarmingly low from businesses and from other sectors, and this is clear throughout these islands. Uh, something the UK government have identified too. Uh, in addition to the website, there is targeting work, targeted work being done through local and national media. Uh, the UK government have started their press campaign. Uh, we, are, we believe we should have our press campaign, but we want to see how the UK government goes, so that has to be done. There also has to be substantial work, word of mouth activity between businesses. Now, I spend a lot of my time meeting organizations, and all the time I'm saying to them, have you talked to businesses in your area, in your sector, about, for example, the, the prepare for Brexit, the get ready for Brexit website, which actually is the best business resource that most people have seen. Um, we will continue to try and do so, but we also have to say to business, we, you really have an obligation now, uh, as everybody does, to find things out. The website is there. They, they, there is targeted information. There are publications. The government no deal notices are there. I don't believe they're very helpful in many regards, but they give some information. It's all there, but it is a message that each member in this parliament should put out in their own communities. It should be get the information now, particularly if you're a small business. You don't have to be exporting to, to the EU. Every business is going to be affected if there is a no deal and they need to pick up that information as, as quickly as they could. Can I make one final point, presiding officer? Uh, Mr. Finlay raises the issue of Nissan and I think it's a really crucial issue because it goes to the heart of the, of the Brexit process. When the uh, Nissan original uh, row took place in 2016, the UK government minister said there is no checkbook. He said there is no sweetener. We now know that an 80 million pound offer was made now, I think it is still 
necessary to have trust in public life. And if a minister says that and then is found not to be telling the truth, there must be consequences. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Tavishgood. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the advance copy of the, the statement. The, the Scottish Government's website mentions the possibility that there may be uh, risk to the availability of some medicines, but it doesn't yet give uh, advice to citizens as to what they can do about that. When does the Cabinet Secretary expect to be able to add to the website with uh, information about what citizens should do in those situations? Can I also ask, if no deal is to be avoided on the Prime Minister's terms. It requires not only a meaningful vote at Westminster, but the passage of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill itself, which will be novel, complex, controversial, amendable, and yet which hasn't even been published in draft form. Has the UK Government shared a draft of that legislation with the Scottish Government, or do we anticipate that Scotland will be treated with the same degree of contempt at that stage as it has been throughout this process? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think it, it is a recipe for disaster in any legislative process to bring any legislation uh, of that nature, that huge complex nature, and to say we want to do it in the way that they want to do it. It can't be done, actually. It just can't be done. I, uh, Mr. Thomas is shouting your continuity bill. The Parliament has a procedure for emergency legislation. It was observed to the letter. And those of us who sat for 12 hours in this chamber going through it in detail knew that that was what was required. I see no such preparations at Westminster for a bill that is 10 times as complex. I, I do pay individual tribute, and people will find this surprising, uh, to a, a Brexiteer minister, Suella Braverman, who resigned recently because she was working on the withdrawal implementation bill and working constructively with myself and a number of others to show us as much as she could at the time. We haven't seen much since she resigned. Uh, we certainly haven't seen that bill in its entirety, and that will be a concern. I I've made it clear in, in recent months I do not believe that they, the UK government can complete its primary or secondary legislation program in the time available to it. If I was saying that two months ago, then clearly I am still saying it and it's still not moving forward. I believe we have a complete crisis in that regard. And moreover, I think UK government ministers accept and believe that too, because many of them are saying so. The only person who doesn't is the prime minister, but she appears to be too deaf to any entreaties. On the final point on, uh, on the issue of, of medicines, substantial work is being done by my colleague Jean Freeman and, and her officials to ensure that that list is narrowed down uh, to, to the, the lowest possible number of items which could be problematic. There will be a substantial role for doctors, for GPs and others to inform their patients in those circumstances. I think we should allow that process to move ahead in that way rather than alarm people by uh, publishing lists of, of, of medicines. I think that's the right way to do it and that's how it will continue to be done. Tavish Scott to be followed by June McCarthy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, on Monday, the UK Government uh, published guidance on exporting and importing fish if there's no Brexit deal. Uh, this explains that Scottish businesses will now have to provide a catch certificate, an export health certificate, a prior notification form, a pre-landing declaration, a storage document, a processing statement. Six separate forms, not so much a sea of opportunities, an ocean of red tape. Uh, what is the Scottish Government seeking to do to alter that disastrous economic uh, and bureaucratic imposition, given how much whitefish is exported by Scottish businesses to the European Union. Cabinet Secretary. The member is absolutely right. Uh, you know, and it, it would be great if we were able to say in this chamber today, let us change those arrangements. The easiest way to change those arrangements, of course, is to be a member of something called the European Union. Yeah. You know, in, in those circumstances, these would not apply. Uh, the, uh, the, the, party, the only party that continues to support this process of Brexit in that way is the party there, and I hope that they will account for themselves uh, to the fishing communities of the north and east and west of Scotland, the communities which I serve too as a member serves, because what they have done is consistently told those communities things that are not true. And for example, for example the argument that exists that says uh, there will be the ability to land whatever catches you want, and sell any way you want, simply was not true. And revealingly, we also saw this week uh, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation accepting that they would have to not increase, but reduce catches if there was no deal, because they would not be able to sell the fish they were catching. That tells you the extraordinary nature of this, a completely false perspective, prospectus sold by the Conservatives, taken up by the fishing community, who will, as usual, find themselves 
betrayed by the yeah. Conservatives. Yeah. Thank you. All the parties have had a, a, a good opening uh, go at this, uh, but there are 10 remaining members wishing to ask a question. Uh, June McAlpine to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary has just said there is no longer time for the UK Parliament to pass the legislation required to prepare for Brexit, and this is particularly the case for the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. Is this not another reason why the UK Government should stop pretending that an extension to Article 50 is not necessary? Be honest with both Parliament and people and seek that extension immediately. Cabinet Secretary. Donald Cameron to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you. Uh, the UK Government has given the Scottish Government £92 million to prepare for Brexit. In light of what the Minister said about security and law enforcement measures, can he confirm that none of that money at all has yet been handed to Police Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I think this idea that in some sense we are the recipients of generosity <laughs> from the UK <laughs> Government in the process of Brexit is utterly bizarre. I mean, it is a perversion of the truth. We have extraordinary uh, uh, requirements upon us, huge difficulties to be met. Uh, we will take care of those in the, in, the, in the competent way that we always do. And when we, listen, when we listen to the Conservatives shouting about this, it proves two things. One is, as we saw earlier with Mr Tompkins, he doesn't understand anything about it. But the second one is, they are seeking to exploit a situation which they were meant to be against. They were meant to be yeah. against Brexit. These are now born-again Brexiteers who are leading the country to disaster. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, Mr Mackay will give an accounting for this, but the real accounting will come at the ballot box when the Tories are judged upon this appalling thing that they have done. Yeah. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Polly McNeill. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet say to confirm that Fourth Valley Division of Police Scotland are no longer authorising new requests for police officers' annual leave, covering the period of about a month, starting on the 29th of March. Can he also confirm that a number of officers trained in public order have been identified for deployment to Northern Ireland in the event of a no deal? And does he agree that this potential disruption to the lives of those working in our emergency services and the increased risks to, to communities across Scotland demonstrates further the complete madness of refusing to rule out a no-deal Brexit and crashing out of the European Union. Cabinet Thank Secretary. you, um, Presiding Officer. There is a question, unlike the one before it, that has some knowledge of what is happening in the police and some concern for it. We note today's announcement that Police Scotland intends to put 360 officers on standby from mid-March. Uh, decisions on police officer staffing, leave and deployment are operational matters. Uh, decisions around officer deployment, contingency planning and mutual aid are also operational matters. But I think we would all welcome the prudent, sensible approach to contingency planning that has come from Police Scotland to ensure that it remains best place to keep people safe. Public order training is an operational ma matter, but as the second biggest force in the UK, Police Scotland has said that they will, of course, consider mutual aid requests, and that is up to the Chief Constable. But it is a reminder of the huge disruption and effort that is going into this matter. And the UK, this is caused by the Tory UK government's chaotic approach to Brexit. There is no other reasoning for this. This is caused by a government which has been hell-bent in achieving something which should not have been achieved, but they are also achieving it very badly indeed. So let us not hear any crocodile tears about the police force. They are the people responsible for where we are. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Pauline McNeill. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that it's critically important that ordinary people who are frightened about Brexit see that the politicians and the parties are working together to prevent the disaster of a no deal. That's what the public expect. And Cabinet Cabinet Secretary, just tell me if the Scottish Resilience Partnership will do a city by city analysis of the impact of our economy. And would you recognise the importance of information coming back from those businesses about how Brexit will affect them? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we receive um, information on and work is done on uh, analysis both uh, regionally and sec uh, by sector uh, through the work of the Chief Economist, for example, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the Mr Mackay's team. So the information does flow in and is flowing in. But I want to uh, absolutely agree with the member on the issue of, of working together. Uh, she and I have differences on a whole range of matters, and across this chamber there will be differences in a whole range of matters. But with the exception of the Conservatives, 
the parties have managed to work together on this issue. Uh, Labour, the SNP, Greens, uh, Liberal, uh, Liberal Democrats have worked together and continue to work together on this basis. Now, it would give even greater strength to this if the Conservatives reverted to the position that they took on during the withdrawal bill, if even better reverted to the position they took during the EU referendum and accepted that this is a disaster which Scotland did not vote for and that they spoke for Scotland. Alas, they only speak for the Conservative Party and that is clear in the votes in this chamber. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Jamie Green. Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, 50 days to go to Brexit and still no deal and no plan. Instead of Tory MP workshops, should the UK Prime Minister not now step up to the plate and put the interests of the countries of the UK before the narrow interests of the Conservative Party? Cabinet Secretary. She should. Uh, she should have done that last year and the year before but she has shown herself to be incapable of doing so. I am, as they say, I hoping, but I don't think it's going to happen. Jamie Green to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Putting aside some of the very predictable political rhetoric in the statement, uh, can, I welcome, can I welcome some of the measures that the Cabinet Secretary proposes in improving connectivity into and out of the Scottish market? Something we should be doing anyway. Can I ask if you could given the opportunity to elaborate further on some of the specific conversations he's having around our port, marine and rail freight capabilities. And bear in mind that Scotland owns a publicly funded airport, which is entirely suitable for freight operations. Is he minded uh, to invite members from right across the chamber to participate in some of these conversations where there is an appropriate constituency or uh, regional interest? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'll always be prepared to involve members uh, who are willing to be involved and whose contribution will be a positive and constructive one. Uh, that would, for example, include supporting efforts being made by, let me get an issue, pluck an issue out of the air, efforts being made by the First Minister to represent Scotland in the United States. And any member who supports that and visibly supports that, I'd be glad to know is supporting uh, Scotland's international potential. Um, on the terms of improving connectivity, uh, the, the Resilience Committee meets this afternoon. In fact, it meets uh, within half an hour. And uh, it, the key topic this afternoon will be some of the issues of connectivity in ports. I visited the port of Zeebrugge uh, just over two weeks ago to understand some of the issues that were arising there. Uh, and I will be part of that discussion this afternoon. And at an appropriate time, I will uh, keep the chamber informed, but I will also make sure that businesses and others are informed because they're the ones who really matter in this. They may have been abandoned by the Conservatives, but not by this government. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. One of the key concerns for many of my constituents relates to medicines, which the Cabinet Secretary covered in his statement. But while many of the practical issues connected to medicine, uh, medical, medicine supply are out with the control of the Scottish Government, the cab could the Cabinet Secretary perhaps expand on the information and advice of the Scottish Government's Chief Pharmaceutical Officer in relation to this and provide some advice for those living with long-term conditions ahead of March 29th? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I, I think the first advice that, that, that would be given, and um, I have that from my, my colleague, the Health Secretary, would be to make sure that there is a conversation with a GP, with your GP, with uh, any GP involved in this, so that they are understand. But I, I will certainly also say, and, and, and the Health Secretary is here, that there may be a case for the Health Secretary or others communicating, for example, with some of the organisations that support people with long-term conditions so that they are reassured about what the situation is. And we can look at uh, seeing if that can take place. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that concludes uh, our statement. Apologies to James Kelly, Angela Constance and Stuart McMillan that we weren't able to reach additional questions. And we'll move straight on to topical questions. We'll just take a few seconds for our ministers and members to change seats.